In continuation of our VRA at 57 series, we have spoken to well a number of people. We spoke to uh, Kalichi, Erasmus Kalichi, a former chief executive. We've also spoken with the current chief executive who uh, has told us about the new VRA. Now we have the board chair of the Volta River Authority. He is Kukwa Wuchi and he's going to be elaborating on the VRA at 57, the new VRA agenda. Thank you, Mr. Thank Wuchi, you. For, for making time to speak with us. Thank you, Israel. So we have heard all about the new VRA from the uh, chief executive and we want to find out a bit more from your perspective where do you see the VRA moving to as far as this new VRA is concerned? Um, in some respects I think that really it's all about empowering and even enlarging the role of the VRA in what it does but doing it differently. Um, so this idea of the new VRA has actually been long in gestation from All the right. same point of view. We've been talking about restructuring for, for many, many years. For many I remember years. we had a conversation about that on the Volta Lake sometimes. It's, it's, it's a long in gestation uh, exercise. But I think there's much greater alignment, you know, from, you know, the, the president of the country all the way down to the management of VRA, including the boards and the ministries. And I think the government is keen to support that effort. What does that really mean? So in the first instance, VRA is an assortment of hydro and thermal projects. We started off with Akosumbo Dam, and then over the years we added a number of thermal projects. And um, those thermal projects have actually been quite helpful in providing power to the country. But as many of you know, yourself included, we've also had challenges, especially financial challenges in buying crude oil to run the plants and the tariff, whether it's cost reflective, but a number of issues like that. And there are many others that we could go on. And just the need and the growing recognition that we have to address and fix those problems once and for all. Now, I'm sure there are various ways you could do that, but certainly one way to do that is to invite the private sector to join you as a partner. And I think this, uh, the government is quite clear, and I think we are also fairly clear that this is not a bad thing. It's, it can be a good thing if we manage it properly. And the idea really is that we would set up this holding company. Um, the hydro part of VRA has also always been something that I think VRA has done well, has been doing it for 57 years. Um, uh, and I think we've established a very good protocol to manage those. The thermal, uh, we've struggled a little bit. All right. So the idea is keep the hydro in, the hydro portion of the company, but in the thermal portion, invite private sector partners to joint venture us. Um, the idea we have really is that we would be partners, um, but we would contemplate uh, uh, the idea that they would be majority partners, 51% above, but we would be substantial minority partners in running those thermal plants. We wouldn't be just a 10-15% a passive investor. We, we would you know, bring our people, our expertise, our knowledge. Hopefully what they would bring is capital, best practice, and really in a way it would be a great platform for us to leverage outside the country. Um, if you look around West Africa, uh, without being too immodest, I mean, VRA is not only uh, the largest utility in the region, but it's probably the most experienced in terms of its people. So with uh, a new platform, a joint venture platform running our thermal assets, we can more aggressively go out in Nigeria, help our folks in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, and really spread out. And we can do that on the back of uh, the West African power pool, which is slowly connecting all of these countries with high voltage transmission line. So there's a real opportunity there to address some of our own liquidity problems, bring best practice, but even go beyond, sort of use it as a platform to go beyond. And then the third part of that new VRA, again, something we've talked about, is a solution for the subsidiaries. So, you know, over the years, we have schools, we have hospitals, hotels, uh, hotels uh, we have a lake transport company, we have a farm, 
and um, they made sense 40 years ago because there were no schools in Akosumbo or no farms uh, really at the time uh, that could attract a lot of capital. But in this day and age, there's really no merit for VRA to continue to even contemplate running them. So put those in a subsidiary um, uh, you know, company in the holding and also find partners. I think the difference there is um, the partner you'd find for the hotel will be quite different from the partner you find for running the Volta Lake the or school. running the school. But really there's a, a real effort to let's get this done oh. because it, it's time to do it. Now you talk about the partnership as far as the Thermo, running the thermal plants or venturing into the thermal business is concerned. I know that you already have some thermal units. How different is that arrangement going to be from what you're envisioning now? So right now, VRA is the 100% owner of most of its thermal plants. Uh, I think the difference really is that in one of them, uh, the Takradi 2 plant or Tico, we have a joint venture where VRA has 10% uh, and the partner has 90%. So in that case, you're the minority. We're the minority. Uh, that's something that's almost 20 years old. I don't see that really changing. But the, uh, the other thing also, I think at the time, that party contracted to give VRA power. So it was VRA's power, but they developed it. The difference now really is that we have a portfolio of, let's say, about 1,000 megawatts between Takradi and Tema. Ideally, uh, let's find a partner that would co-manage those megawatts with us, all of them. So as I said, maybe they have 51% and we have 49, possibly 60, we have 40. But, but run it as a, as, a, as a conglomerate, as a unit, would be the idea. So this arrangement or this joint venture you're envisioning, would that be what uh, may have been misconstrued as the sale of uh, some of VRA's uh, thermal plant, or indeed you intend to sell? You know, um, when the new government came in now over a year and uh, almost a half ago, um, there was some talk very early on of the sale of some assets. Uh, I think that discussion has been refined, let's call it that, um, where even if there was a sale, and I think the sale is probably not the right word, it would be to seek a partner where VRA would still be in involved. But, but I mean, I think it's fair to say there was that idea at first, but my sense of it is that um, an outright sale is not something um, that any of us really want. Certainly VRA does not want an outright sale. Um, we would wish to be partners on any of the projects, whether we sell them individually, whether we sell them as part of a portfolio, we will want to be active partners. So an outright sale where we just hand over uh, is not something we would, uh, we would uh, either wish, desire, or wish to pursue. All right. So the new VRA that you're going to be pursuing now, what are the timelines? You know, we've already started that exercise, if you will. Uh, I think government itself has uh, engaged or is in the middle of engaging a transaction advisor. Uh, we've mapped out as a board and a management what needs to be done. Um, uh, you know, when we're looking at just starting with the easy stuff, the, the subsidiaries, uh, we're in process of re-registering all of them, putting in new boards, uh, putting in new plans, and starting the process for finding partners. Something we had started a few years ago, but we, we never got very far. So there's a renewed, okay, let's get it done. And that process has started, even bringing in some new personnel. Um, and I think on the thermal side, we've started to take a, a sort of a, a very granular look at all our assets and their value and, and what we would use them for uh, in, in that new dispensation. So we've started to do, let's call it the homework. Ultimately, you know, we have to work with government to sort of align in terms of timelines. But I would say that that process of looking for partner has started. All right. It, it will just take some time, yeah. Now about the um, workers of VRA, there are the, the a whole lot of them. How involved are they in, in this new VRA drive? And uh, is this something they're buying into? 
That's a fair question, uh, Israel. Um, they need to be very involved, if only to at least know what's going on. And uh, I hope that, you know, as, as a board and management, we can sort of pass on the right messages. Um, but it's still early days. And I, I think, you know, you pointed out, I think about a year ago, there was initial anxiety about the sale that has been muted because I don't think anyone sees that happening anymore. Um, in terms of next steps of, you know, where is this partner coming from? Um, I don't know that the plan is concrete enough to communicate. Okay. Uh, but, but clearly we, we have to do a good job to bring them on board. All right. Now, what, do we ex what should we, we be expecting uh, if the new VRA takes off, like you're envisioning? Well, it should be a, a more profitable company. Um, it should have um, a better running efficiencies across the board. I mean, what's the point of bringing a partner if they don't improve on what you can do? Um, and really, a much more capable VRA, really. And um, I want to believe that if we do a good job, it'll be much more fit for purpose for the times we're in. And, you know, again, you know, if you cast your mind back, you know, 50 years ago, VRA was a monopoly, was a monopoly for 40 years of that 50. Um, it could do things a certain way. Well, today, uh, there are a number of IPPs in the system, independent power producers, and VRA as VRA is producing about half of the country's power. There are all these other private folks out there. So, you know, the old way of doing things just won't work. And so VRA has to become more efficient, more competitive, more customer facing. It can't have schools that uh, don't make a profit or hospitals that, uh, you know, don't uh, serve their customers well. There are too many things that, uh, if you will, um, are happening around the VRA uh, that VRA can not afford to sort of ignore anymore. If the school, for instance, is going to, as it is now, the school is 100% uh, owned by VRA. That's right. If that changes, I can imagine that the, you can expect some anxiety amongst the workers who have always you know, known that they could you know, get into Akosombo International. And now it turns out that this, it's under new management and VRA doesn't have much control or that much control. You know, you'd be surprised. I mean, first of all, competition is not a bad thing, uh, generally. Hopefully it will mean that Akosomo International, as an example, will, will realize the pressure to be a much better school than it has been because now it's competing more for the people out there. But actually we found something very interesting. Today, 70% uh, of the students in Akosombo SHS actually are not VRA staff. Uh, uh, children yeah, of VRA okay. staff. I mean, they come from all over the country. So even that whole idea of you know, doing something for the, for the staff is, is falling away. Uh, it's true that the, you know, the JSS and the primary, there's much more, you know, it's less of a boarding institution and there's more of the staff children in those schools. So even there, you know, that idea of, well, we have to keep it for VRA is, is falling away. And I, but I, I think, I mean, to be fair, between the school, the hospital, for instance, we, we probably have to think of them a bit differently okay, from, from, say, the, the hotel the okay. or the lake transport because there's a, a certain social uh, dimension to it that we have to keep in mind. But, but I, I imagine it, we, we can do that. I mean, it's not like you know, we're reinventing the wheel or there's something very unusual we're trying to do. We're just trying to make it a bit more uh, um, really efficient and, and work better. And, and not have these sort of little enclaves that uh, sort of don't connect to the rest of the world. Mm. What's the assurance you're going to be giving uh, Ghanaians in general that with all the changes that you have lined up, things are not going to be looking you know, down south instead of uh, <laughs> being optimistic? Um, from a certain point of view, you know, there are no guarantees in life, are there? Um, but uh, I think today, uh, what I would say is that, um, you know, what I would say about how and, and, and we get things done, you've got to look at the team that's getting it done. And, and I think that, um, 
you know, we've got uh, a good management team in place. You interviewed the chief executive. He's got a, a new management team that he's put in place. I think the board is a very capable board. I think we've got some very, um, uh, very uh, respected and competent luminaries like uh, Dr. Ayi and I commented here, Chief Musa Adam, who was a former MD of VCG, and various others who, frankly, are... And of course yourself, a former, a former chief, chief executive. executive. <laughs> I think so it's a good board who understands the issues and has a good sort of sense of sort of the commercial climate out there. So we have a good board. And then, you know, last but not least, we have a government who is actually keen to get things done. And I think that alignment is really very important because if you miss any one of those, you know, what tends to happen is that you say all the right things and nothing happens or it happens very slowly. And now you actually have a government very keen to push. You have a board that is also very keen to sort of refresh the VRA. And then you have a management who actually understands the need to do it. So I, I think certainly the ducks are in the right row right. and it's, it's a good place to start. Are there any particular objectives that you, as chairman of the board, would want to be pursuing or be pushing? I, was, I certainly would like to see us complete the process. We've really been talking about it for such a long time. Uh, we were talking about it in my time. We started certain things. The, the good news is that we've actually done a lot of groundwork that we may not have acted on, but we've done a lot of studies, homework, thinking, and now it's the time to actually implement. I think uh, it would be uh, a great satisfaction to all of us that we actually find that private sector partner for our thermal assets, find that private sector partner for the hotel, you know, get, get those transactions in place. Because ultimately, I think it will really be a good thing. I mean, VRA by itself, with all the challenges it faces in the past sector, cannot run these things. I mean, it, it just, you know, we're asking too much of the authority. So I think that's very important. Another very important uh, area is uh, the North, NETCO, uh, because uh, you know that we operationalized that company when I was the chief executive. All of that was with the idea of empowering it to sort of stand on its own. And, and guess what? You know, you have the Millennium Challenge coming. Right. They are giving NETCO $60 million to do all kinds of things. Uh, it couldn't have happened as a department. And the North is really a great opportunity for not just VRA but the whole country because it's you know economically probably the least developed area and you know that idea and the vision of electricity as a transformative force can really take hold there yeah. so there's a lot we can do there so you know these are things that we're going to spend time on think about make sure we have the right team I think the final point I would say is that um, we were having a conversation earlier. We already have some very good technical people, and uh, we now have to create the opportunities for a lot of these people who have been there 10, 20 years. You know, we've got a lot of young people. We've got to bring them through the organization and give them opportunity. You refer to challenges that we already has had to endure, and one of them I know too well is how you insulate yourself from governmental influence because a lot of the time government would want you to go in a particular direction which may not necessarily be in the interest of the authority. How are you as board chair going to ensure that? It has to be a collective effort. Uh, I, one person can't do that. But I think it's important to say that this new board that is in, that I chair, actually has made that one of its priorities and uh, we actually tasked management uh, in one of our last board meetings to help us understand just how some of the past government actions have affected um, the VRA and really what the next steps ought to be. And, and there are a few different ideas that go with that uh, and it's not a one size or a, a, a silver bullet but I mean you start with engagement and communication and sort of you know, getting, you know, the government to understand that these things actually damage the authority and, you know, in many respects defeat the purpose that they have to begin with. And it's not always clear to them. Um, so, you know, the first point of contact is really a much more robust engagement with government. How do we, how does government understand, you know, we have to sort of convey the issues to them. Um, 
But you know, the, there's a second and third part which has to do with governance itself and sort of doing things properly, whatever that means. Um, but you know, there are many well laid out processes. What I would say there is that, again, I, I've been encouraged by you know this government's. Um, th there's an energy from you know the state enterprise uh, area and um, the, the new minister of public service. I think Mr. Samabati. I mean, there's an effort to really sort of take hold of these enterprises and get them to work properly and to work properly means uh, you know work <laughs> without being managed right. anyhow <laughs> so even the government I think recognize that need so it's a bit of an alignment there but you know it's actually an ongoing exercise I mean just because I say today you are hurting me doesn't mean it will make any difference tomorrow so that engagement is important um, I, I think a commitment by the board in particular to sort of stick to proper governance is important and and you know if we engage properly what it means is that when there is a problem you, you it's not the first time they're going to hear from you when you're in trouble they, 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 they respect what you have to say you know there's time for you to discuss these things and I think we've got to sort of sort of create those lines and keep them open one other issue that um, I like to bring up has to do with a recent downward review in utility tariffs. Was it a situation that government essentially put pressure on you to just back down on your demands? I don't think so. Uh, I, I know for a fact that VRA actually put a tariff submission requesting an increase. I, I know that for a fact. And then when it was time for you to justify? Um, maybe our justification wasn't as strong as <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. But I, I think early on in the whole process, even before the the final tariffs were announced. Uh, I mean, there was a sense, and you know, you're not wrong, where you know, government felt there were opportunities to reduce the tariff. It's not uh, actually a very simple thing, and I, I think you probably appreciate that. So, VRA is the beneficiary of the wholesale tariff, but you and I, and everybody else, are, are sort of the consumers consumers of the end user tariff. And the end user tariff has about 10 different categories. You know, you have the uh, special tariffs for mines, the low voltage, high voltage, medium voltage. You have tariffs for the commercial folks like, you know, barbershops and hotels. You have the residential tariffs. So there are quite a few. And there was always a sense that on the high end, they were too high. And on the low end, they were too low. And I think there's been this sense for quite a while, and it's something that even VRA shared. There had to be some f way to levelize them. Maybe the net effect wouldn't change much, but they wouldn't be so unequal. All right. So I think the hope has been that that tariff exercise would address that, and it has to some extent. I think our hope was that at the generation wholesale, we would get something. But there's also something else going on, which is now the PRC is looking at tariffs plant by plant. And, and um, so all of that is to say, um, yes, we would have liked an increase. We did know that there was a review going on to try and make things more equal and a bit fairer. We did know, for instance, that there was an opportunity in gas, which is a, a big component of our prices right. to come down, which, which it has. So from a certain point of view, there were some good opportunities to actually bring the tariff down. Did it mean we didn't want a tariff increase? It would have been nice to get one. But really, I think uh, I, I certainly feel that the priority had to be on that end user tariff and make it a bit more equitable. Okay. What aspect of the new VRA can ensure that we do not return to those days where we're going to have to endure extensive power outages, uh, which we've come to know as doom so? I think that's an excellent question. My uh, sort of, you know, fairly sort of simple assessment of how we got to doom so is uh, really a financial one. You know, we, we didn't have the right financial incentives in place to uh, start with the tariff, to manage our operating costs and plan for capital, which takes a while. You know, if you have the money, you can plan. If you don't have the money, 
you live hand to mouth. And we lived hand to mouth for a number of years until there was a genuine deficit and we had no buffer. And that really explains the situation. If we can implement the new VRA and we can, and it, it's, it's, it's a, we by ourselves as VRA cannot do it alone. Uh, we certainly need the help of the regulators, we need the help of government uh, as well. But I think our job is to make VRA as efficient, as profitable as possible. Not, not to sort of make money, you know, so that a few people enjoy it, but to be profitable as a benchmark for efficiency, to be profitable as a, uh, that we are taking care of our costs, uh, we are managing our operations properly, we can buy our crude oil, we don't need anybody's help. That is what we have to do, and if the new VRA takes off, I think we have a very good chance of being able to achieve that, which means that uh, we won't be living hand to mouth as much as we used to, and you know, when there's a, a, a genuine you know, deficit in the future, we can better manage that. And if government owes you, it would clear its debts? Well, that's a strong request from our end, and uh, hopefully they will honor that. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Awoche, for making time to speak with us. This has been really enlightening. Thank you, Israel. The Volta River Authority has keenly pursued its mission since its establishment on April 26, 1961, of powering the Ghanaian economy in a safe manner and has entrenched its core values, commitment, integrity, trust, teamwork and accountability in daily operations. As you celebrate another year, I congratulate all staff, both past and present, for your invaluable contribution towards the enviable successes that the company has been able to achieve over the years. Happy 57th anniversary.